Hey guys and welcome to a video where I briefly explain how to make a bullet hell for a game jam. Around late February I joined the Wowie Jam where the theme was Failure is progress. In short, I made a somewhat simple bullet hell game and well I didn't really do very well. So what I've decided to do is instead to teach you how I made the base of my game. The premise of my game was that it was a simple bullet hell but you constantly switch colours from green to red, and dying when you are red will get you to the next stage, where it gets harder but you get a multiplier to your points. However, today we won't go over that because I stripped the game down to its basics to teach you the premise of it. It's also a really nice template to start from, especially for a game jam. Speaking of game jams, the third bullet hell game jam starts on April the 15th, and it lasts until the 22nd. If you like making bullet hell games, this is the jam for you. Last year's game jam was my first ever, and in short, I didn't really do very well either because it, it was an overscope mess. But the jam was really fun anyway, so if you want to join, I'll put a link to the jam in the description. Anyway, let's move on and I'll show you how this game works. First of all, I used the code from the first three episodes to the bullet hell tutorial for moving and dashing the player character. Although I did take out the animation part, since our current player character is a static square. Since most of the code from the player is actually movement, the only thing that has been added is the player dying. So let's look at that now. How it's been set up is that each bullet is a circle with its own defined radius, and how the player checks for collisions is if the distance to the bullet is less than the radius of the bullet, and if this happens the player just instantly dies and goes back to the menu screen. In the code, we first get all the bullets in the room by using a collision rectangle list that encompasses the entire room, so all the bullets in the room go to the list called bullet. We then iterate through each bullet with a for loop and find the smallest value of variable bullet distance, which is the distance from the centre of the player to the edge of the bullet. After finding the smallest value of this, we check whether they are colliding, since we calculate bullet distance by taking away the radius of said bullet from the distance between them. If the radius of the bullet was larger than the distance between them, the result would be negative. Therefore we can use this by checking whether bullet distance is negative, resulting in a collision, and also check if it's dashing or not. If there is a collision, we simply clear the screen, add 1 to the death counter, and go back to the menu room. This finishes up everything in the player character, so what's left is to go over the rest of the game. Looking at OBJ game, we can first see that it's persistent, meaning that it will carry over through room transitions, so you won't have to spawn it in every time you enter a room. Code wise, this essentially spawns in the attacks and updates the difficulty and such, and create event sets up the variables, such as the tutorial text and score, and it also begins the alarm that creates the attack. The step event updates the timer, the score on the stage. The timer, survive duration, is the amount of game frames that the player has survived, so it can increment by 1 every frame. The score is the number of seconds, so the frames divided by 60, since this game is actually capped at 60 FPS. Next, the stage can be seen as the difficulty of the game, so the higher the number, the more bullets, and this increments every 5 seconds, so every 300 game frames. Lastly, the boundary of the attack interval gets updated since it scales with the stage. Also, in the step event, you can toggle full screen by pressing P, which works by using an if statement to check for keyboard input, and it just sets it to the reverse of if it's full screen or not. Moving on to the alarm, this section spawns in the two types of attacks, a circle attack and a border attack. I'll go through this in more detail later, but essentially some attacks come from the edge of the screen, and some go outwards from a single point. The type of attack is determined randomly by a switch statement and the iRandom function, that gets a random integer from 0 to the argument, in our case 1. Then, it'll get some random numbers using iRandom range, and plug them into a script that makes the attack depending on what type it is. Afterwards, it sets an alarm for itself again, to continue a cycle of attacks. However, if the player dies, the cycle breaks, cause well, there would be no one to shoot at, and we could do this by putting an if statement to check whether the player object exists. The draw GUI event displays tutorial text on your first run only, and also displays your score at the top of the UI, but first we have to set it up, which is the role of these three lines of code. These set the font, colour and alignment of the text, 
so that draw text will draw white text with the font defined by main text, and the origin of the text will be in the middle. Once it's set up, we can display the current score at the top middle of the screen, so an X of half the screen width, and a Y of 32. The tutorial text is displayed at the bottom middle of the screen, so it also half the screen width for X, but for the Y it will be the room height, minus 64. The string that it draws, however, depends on how many times you died. All the tutorial text is stored in an array, and the index that we display the text as is your def cam clamped, so that it stays within the boundaries of the array. Finally, in OBJ game, we have the room start event that essentially resets all the variables like the survive duration and restarts all the alarms again. What's left to explain now is simply how the two attacks work in the menu screen. Let's look at these attacks first. How these scripts work is that when called, it spawns in an object that actually makes the attack. This is because an object can make the attack on an alarm, so before the attack it could warn the player with a visual, drawn in a draw GUI event. For the border attack, it draws rectangles at the border of the screen, and the circle attack draws a circle where the attack's gonna land. Also in each script, we set the object's variables with what was in the argument. Now that the scripts have been covered, we can go to the objects themselves. Obitray attack border and the other attack object only has a create alarm and a draw GUI event. The create event just sets some variables to zero, so let's first look at the draw GUI event. As I said earlier, the draw GUI event displays the warnings, so for this case, we first draw a red rectangle over the entire screen. Then we draw a second, slightly smaller rectangle, that's still in the middle so that it's not all red. Obviously this would cover up everything in the room, so to counter this, all the objects such as the player have to draw themselves on top of the warnings. Alternatively, you could draw four separate red rectangles, but they would still overlay on top of the player, so you would have to draw the self anyway. In the alarm, we have the actual attack. How this works is that we first generate a random point in the rectangle that's slightly bigger than the room. Then, we repeat this process until the point is not in the room, resulting in a point that's just outside of the room. Once we find this point, we just spawn in the bullet and set its size, speed, and direction towards the player. We repeat this until we've gotten the number of bullets that we want, and then finally it destroys itself because it's not needed anymore. Looking at OBJ attack circle, it's mainly the same idea that we initialise more variables in the create events. Do the attack in alarm 0, and draw the warning in draw GUI. The warning is formed with two circles, so one red one, and a smaller black one to put a hole in the red one, which overall draws a really thick outline of a circle. What this attack actually does is it spawns bullet outwards in a circle pattern. This is done using a for loop instead of a repeat for reasons that I'll explain now. We take the angle between each bullet, 360 over the number of total bullets, and we multiply it by i so that the rotation moves along a bit each time. Finally, we can add an offset onto the direction if we want. After we find the direction of the bullet, we simply create the bullet and set its variables to the direction and size and speed, much like the border attack. This object also deletes itself afterwards because it has no use. This is all the gameplay covered, so all that's left is the object that handles the menu. The menu object is quite simple. We first have a game start event, and much like the create event, is used for setting things up. However, we only want this to happen one time, because unlike the game object, the menu object is not persistent. So if we put it in the create event, the score would reset every time we went into the menu room, which would be a problem. Therefore, we put it in the game start event, so this doesn't happen. Next, the draw GUI event draws a bunch of text, so we've got the title here with the big font, and also your score and your press key to start prompt in the smaller font down there. These fonts were made as a separate asset, and you can see that when you make a font, you can edit the size, font, and other things about it. That's just about everything for this game code-wise, so let's finish this with a quick show-off. If we run this, we are met with a very blank menu screen, because there hasn't really been anything fancy done to it. So let's start. You can see that there's a tutorial text at the bottom and the score at the top. There are a number of things we can obviously improve, like juice on a wider variety of attacks, or just some sound effects really. Uh, I'll put a link to this project in the description, so you can use it for yourself, 
and also my Rally Jam game if you want any ideas on where to improve this. But for now, I'll see you in the next video.